I'd like to welcome everyone to the October 10th, 2023 Local Superintendent's Advisory Council meeting. We have a new member in attendance today, Superintendent Karen Solis uh, from the Anchorage Independent School District. We'd like to welcome you to LSAC. Thank you. Solis. Any, any words of wisdom before we get started? Um, I just appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to um, getting to know everyone and learning from from all of the wisdom that's in this room, not just sitting at this table. So thank you. Well, from Miss Alicia, from what I hear, you bring a, a, a great background of knowledge yourself. And we're thank you for being a part of this and well, willing to serve. So welcome aboard. And thank uh, you. We'll, uh, if there's anything we can help you with, and of course, we'll return the favor and ask you if anything we need to. So, but thank you for being here. Uh, to begin our meeting, uh, Interim Commissioner Kenny is in a meeting at the Capitol building today, and she uh, she had the utmost uh, desire to be here today, and hopefully she will maybe will be in uh, once the meeting at the Capitol is, is over. But we are blessed to have Dr. Woods Tucker with us, and he's going to provide an update from the Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of LSAC, guests, uh, and folks who are viewing. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, sit in for Interim Commissioner uh, Robin Kenny Fields. I'll give you a quick uh, update on her, but but before I do that, I would be remiss if I didn't say as a recovering superintendent, I want to say thank you, each, <laughs> each one of you, for the tremendous work uh, that you do in improving and saving the lives uh, of the uh, public school kids across uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So thank you. Thank you for your tremendous work. Well, let me give you a, a couple brief comments uh, about interim uh, Commissioner Fields. Uh, Robin Kenny Fields uh, was currently... Um, was an associate commissioner who uh, oversees the Office of Finance and Operations. Uh, she assumed this role on September 30th of this year. Uh, Robin first joined KDE from 2003 to 2008, and then she rejoined in 2015. She previously served as interim commissioner for a short time uh, during uh, the 2019 year uh, with the departure of a former commissioner. Now, in her current role, she oversees four divisions that deal with budget and financial management, resource management, district support, school and community uh, nutrition. Uh, as uh, Chair Fletcher said, uh, uh, Interim Commissioner Fields will try to, uh, Kenny uh, Fields, Kenny will try to make it here uh, before her meeting is up and certainly she apologizes for not being here. Just a little bit other information here. On August 21st, the Kentucky Board of Education authorized the Kentucky Department of Education to issue a solicitation for a national search firm that will begin a search for a new commissioner. Uh, the RFP closed on September 25th. Now, once a vendor is selected and the contract is executed, the process of uh, the processing of a contract can take up to about 30 days. Uh, chair Robinson, Chair uh, Chair Sharon Robinson, who is the chair of the Kentucky Board of Education, states that the goal is for the search firm to commence work no later than December 1st. Over the next three months, the Kentucky Board of Education members will be engaging with various stakeholders, groups, including all KDE advisory councils, really to inquire about uh, the traits they hope to see in the next state's next commissioner, as well as uh, what those top priorities should be. And I want to certainly give the uh, Kentucky uh, Board of Education members uh, credit. Uh, they've already talked with the Commission of Student Advisory Council and the agency's Family Partnership Council have participated in discussions. And uh, Chair Robinson uh, gathered feedback, I think it was on September 12th, at our monthly uh, superintendents webcast. So uh, superintendents and other folks have, have not given any feedback to the Kentucky Board of Education. Please do so. And then the last thing I certainly want to uh, uh, give kudos uh, to those who attended and participated in this year's uh, Continuous Improvement Summit, and also a special uh, congratulations to the uh, nine winners of the Continuous Improvement Summit. Uh, Chair Fletcher, that's all I have, unless you have any questions uh, for me or anything you'd like for me to pass on to uh, Interim Commissioner Kenny. Uh, I, I don't have any questions, but thank you for being here. Uh, any questions from our members? Anyone online? If not, um, our next portion of the meeting, we're going to be talking about the accountability cut scores recommended by the standard setting committee. And as many of you, as all of you know, Senate Bill 158 of 2020 made several changes to the statewide accountability system, including the establishment of status and change as ways to evaluate state indicators. This will be the first year where change is reported. A panel of education stakeholders gathered in Frankfurt, September 13th through the 15th, 
participate in a standard setting process for Kentucky's accountability system. Superintendent Mitchell and I were honored to represent LSAC as part of this process. By unanimous vote, the standard setting committee recommended cut scores that define performance expectations for status levels, very low through very high, and change levels decreased significantly through increased significantly for each state indicator and cut scores that will determine a school's overall performance rating. As required by KRS 158.6455, the recommended cut scores will need to be approved by the Kentucky Department of Education and LSAC. The cut scores are expected to remain in place for six years or until they no longer support meaningful differentiation. I want to reemphasize that. Uh, just keep in mind that we're here, we're not voting on the process, we're not voting on the accountability system. What we're charged with under KRS 158.6455 is to uh, set the cut scores. So we'll be voting for the cut scores and so will the Kentucky Department of Education. So that's that's our goal today. Uh, again, we we will be talking about cut scores, not exactly the the process as as it's uh, or actually the overall accountability system. As we all know, uh, I think there's several of us at the table, including myself. There's things that I would change about the accountability system. Uh, there's uh, and I'll mention maybe some later on, but uh, but again, we are here to talk about cut scores, and that's what we're required to do as part of statute. In today's meeting, background information will be provided, including about the requirements of Senate Bill 158, required accountability measures, the process used by the standard setting committee to inform the recommendations, and notes about the results of the standard setting process. Any questions LSAC members have regarding the process and recommended performance standards will be addressed. In addition, LSAC will be supported in a guided process to reach a decision on whether to approve the recommended accountability performance standards. Um, before I turn this over to uh, Associate Commissioner Sims and, and her staff, I want to remind LSAC that back in May, we were asked three questions to have input. And that input was taken to, L to the, uh, accountability, uh, I'm sorry, the accountability group. And I do believe that the accountability group followed those. Just to remind you of the questions, it said, should the standard setting committee be encouraged to maintain comparability and status performance level cut scores set in 2020? Or should the standard setting committee be encouraged to make any adjustments to the status level cut scores established in 2022 that they may think of most appropriate? Appropriate. And we did get information from LSAC to take that in. Then also, too, should the standard setting uh, panel be encouraged to consider defining a change rating of maintained or at least a higher than as the previous year or performance within a certain margin higher or lower than the previous year? And then finally, the last question we were asked was, should the standard setting panel be encouraged to consider different change cut scores for each status level or should the same cut score define change regardless of status? So again, I do uh, thank uh, KDE and also the, the Center for Assessment for asking our have our input previous. I do believe the accountability group took the, the input of LSAC and moved forward with, with this uh, information. So this time I'm gonna turn it over to Rhonda Sims, Jennifer Stafford, and Kevin Hill with the Office of Assessment Accountability. And I believe joining us online is uh, Chris Domaleski, Brian Gong, and Lauren Pinsonneau. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Fletcher, and appreciate the time and opportunity to be here with you again to talk about accountability standard setting. And uh, as Chair Fletcher mentioned, we are very appreciative of the information you've provided us on several opportunities to be with you and your thinking. Uh, you know, this on the surface is a quite simplistic concept system with change in status, but there's lots of data behind the scenes, lots of detail behind the scenes. And so uh, I just uh, actually, Chair Fletcher did a great job and kind of the overview, uh, we did provide you in advance uh, a fairly extensive PowerPoint with the cuts, with the data information uh, and the impacts data. We also provided you a little brief uh, summary of the meeting. So if it uh, pleases the committee today, we'll kind of take a highlight approach and not necessarily go through every slide. And I, I see kind of affirming head nods and we're looking on a camera there as well. And so we'll just mention a couple of things. And obviously more than anything, we want to be part of your discussion today, answer any questions you have, get you to that comfort level uh, before you make your decision. Uh, I, as uh, Chair Fletcher mentioned, you know, this comes into place from Senate Bill 158 that passed right before the pandemic shutdown in 2020. So it has taken us to 2030. 23 to get it fully into place. Uh, it does require, and if we'll move on with the slide here, it does require a exclusive list of indicators. And so the system is very prescribed 
in state law. So we have a list of indicators. And for each of those, we're to look at status and change. And then we're to put together a color reporting system within the school report card, uh, a color-coded dashboard. And uh, again, uh, if they're, uh, the components of this, the cut scores were previously set and that may no longer apply. And uh, we've got a little statement there at the end of that. So we had to have a new process of continuation learning from what we did last year in order to bring in this change element, which is new to this year. As we go to the next statute, uh, Chair Fletcher mentioned your role as part of this process. Uh, you are an approver of the cut scores that came out of this standard setting work along with KDE. And so uh, Interim Commissioner Kenny will be the KDE uh, approver of that work. As we move to the next slide, just to remind you, again, status is that current year performance. It's what we've always reported in Kentucky, the current year performance on what indicators are in accountability system. We began reporting that last year. Then in the second year of the system, we were able to say, what about the change or the difference between the current year, which is 23, and the pri pri previous year or prior year of 22. And uh, the change is, again, a simple concept, but a quite complex. And how can you bring that together in the system? And we looked at a lot of measures. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go along today. The system with each of those indicators in the end will have an indicator score. So the, the law defines how we'll come up with change. It's a simple math. Uh, it's taking current year and subtracting uh, the prior year. Once you get that change number, though, the prior year work falls away. We no longer look at that. And we just say, what's that change number? And the scales for change are quite different than the scales for status. The status scales can go from zero to 125 in proficiency, for example. They go up to 140 for English learners. Change is more like a negative maybe 10, 15, somewhere in that range, up to maybe a positive 20. So very different kind of scales, which complicates the putting together of those two scales. So as we work through some options for combining them, the sim most simplistic process that was approved for us federally was to simply take the current year score, 23, and add to it the change. Keep in mind, we all know not all change is positive sometimes. So that means there could be a negative number in there as well as, uh, as the, uh, an addition uh, purely. So the indicator scores then are used to produce that overall score. And the overall score is weighted by weights established by the Kentucky Board. And that is what is used in the federal piece of the system. Uh, we have to rank order schools and identify the bottom 5% for support. So those are federally defined rules for how to generate that. And so the, over, the indicator score uh, contributes to the overall score. Now, when we get to the reporting of the system, it's very simplistic. So again, lots and lots of data behind the scenes, but very simplistic that we're looking at levels. And Jennifer and I have developed a little mnemonic as we've tried to train folks. A level is a word. A level is a word. It's a descriptive word. So it's very low to very high. It's decreed, declined significantly and to, up to increase significantly. So you have a descriptive word. There are some directional indicators you'll see that go on the school report card and some colors that are used. But color is usually associated with a rating. And I teasingly have used the example, I'm big on mnemonic devices. You know, when we cross a certain age point, people need to start thinking about memory devices. But uh, I always talk about RC. I grew up in rural Kentucky. I bet some of you've had an RC cola before when you were a kid. Rating is color. So the rating is always the color in the system. So the overall performance rating aggregates all to, uh, the data together and it's conveyed as a color. And so we have, and then we also have numbers behind the scenes that will be reported, particularly your district assessment coordinators and you will want numbers. You'll want to see your numbers. And so the numbers will all be there. They'll be in uh, the data spreadsheets, uh, that we provide as well as things that are posted, but a lot of the appearance on the public card is really the color. 
and it's around the descriptive words that's called the level. So what you're looking at today is what came out of this panel work uh, that are those recommended cuts for when we go from particular uh, colors within some of the system. And then also we remember we have a five by five table that brings together color and uh, brings together a color for change in status and shows where it intersects. And so our partners from the center are gonna walk you through a little of that detail along with the, the panel discussion. I know that we have on Brian and Laura, I'm not sure if Chris was able to be with us today, but I will turn it over to our partners at the Center for Assessment and many of you have worked with uh, this team of people before. We, uh, they've been great colleagues in uh, all of the various changes to the accountability system and bring an incredible amount of statistical, technical pol policy expertise to the table. So I will uh, turn at this point. I'm not sure who's going to start today, but we're ready for you. Good morning. Uh, this is Brian Gong, and I'm glad that Laura Pensano is able to join us today. Our colleague Chris Domaleski is on vacation, and so he regrets not being able to uh, be here today. Uh, we'll um, spend just a few minutes giving some background. We know that people received the information before, and and uh, we don't want to. Um, we'll, we'll err on the side of giving less, and then if you have questions or comments, we'd be glad to respond to those. Uh, if we could go back one slide. Uh, back one slide, um, all of the structural parts of the accountability system were set by policy making boards. The, the uh, uh, state general assembly said that there would be status, five levels change, five levels overall. Uh, the board uh, said how the status and change would be put together for indicators. Uh, but what they did not say was what was good enough to qualify a school performance as very low status, for example, or increase significantly change, for example, or what a blue performance or any color performance and overall was. Determining the, what was good enough was left to the uh, department to establish a procedure. The department um, uh, asked the Center for Assessment to devise a standard setting process, a process by which these good enough standards or criteria could be established. Uh, we appreciate that the department is a strong proponent for doing that in an open, inclusive way. Uh, my experience, we, the Center works as contracts with over 30 states, and most of the states do this work by having a department committee do it. They do not involve much uh, public uh, input, and they certainly don't do it in a uh, open process the way that Kentucky has. Uh, we're, we're grateful for uh, the departments establishing this process because we feel it's much stronger, both in terms of its credibility, but also in terms of its substance. So a, a panel was um, of, uh, people to set these standards was established. Most of them had repeated from last year when the cut scores for the status uh, levels were set. And uh, the, the process uh, involved two different parts. If we could um, go to the, I think, uh, two, two slides from now. Um, Let's go to another uh, another one. There, there were uh, two. Um, if we could advance the, to the next one, the uh, there were uh, two parts. One was um, uh, as uh, Chair Fletcher mentioned, we checked with uh, LSAC to get guide policy guidance on some key decisions, uh, the three decisions that he met uh, mentioned, and then there was uh, there were two workshops. One to to develop. The, the qualitative descriptors of what performance consists of. What, what does um, green performance look like or green status performance? What does the uh, overall blue, uh, stat, uh, blue performance look like? And then in September, the panel came together and using those descriptions and data, they established the cut scores. The, the process for doing that involved the um, Standard setting panel panelists working individually 
in uh, small groups and then as overall groups. And in each case, uh, they were asked to make a judgment on their own, talk about it with their small group, and then talk about it with a large group. And, and then people submitted the numbers and, and uh, had a chance to vote. And so the recommendations that you are going to see or that you uh, have seen and that Laura will just summarize are an outcome of that process where people spent uh, hours immersed in, in saying, what do these mean and what are the implications? And uh, there was a broad range of uh, opinion of, in the group and they had lots of different backgrounds coming. Uh, one of the, the main things that we have wanted to emphasize is that there was a group evaluation at the end of the meeting and the recommended cuts were, uh, were almost, uh, the, the ratings were very high. They were almost 90% of the people said that they agreed with the recommendations or strongly agreed with them. That's a very strong uh, finding in terms of the, uh, the outcome from a very diverse uh, group of people. Let me stop there and just uh, ask if there are any questions about the process. Any questions from the group or anyone online? I think, uh, Dr. Okay. Gong, I think the preliminary work that the center did with uh, LSAC uh, got us ready for today. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity, but I don't think there's any questions in the room. So if you will proceed, please. Okay, great. Laura uh, can, can give a quick summary of the recommendations uh, themselves. Good morning, everybody. My name is Laura Pensano. It's very nice to see you all and thank you for the time. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, as Brian said, I just wanted to take a moment really to level set. Um, I know you had the materials in advance. We don't want to take any more of your time than is needed, but I'm just going to walk briefly through um, the slides that cover the, um, the impact data, the cut scores and impact data. Um, as Brian already indicated, the cut scores that we did, uh, that the group did recommend, were overwhelmingly supported um, by the group um, after a many uh, multi-stage process of uh, individual cuts, uh, recommendations, table discussion, full group discussion, opportunities to change those individual recommendations and continued review of the data. And um, so the cut scores that the group ended up recommending, um, we would consider are based on those descriptions the group developed in June. So we would consider them to be, you know, appropriately um, norm and criterion reference based on those descriptions. Uh, we see coherence within and across those um, the descriptions themselves, as well as the recommendations that came from the group. And um, so what we wanted to do is just, I think, um, and if when you go to slide, let's see, I think it's slide 18. Just a couple more, there we go, thank you. So um, you saw a few of these slides. What we're looking at right now are the cut score recommendations um, for all of the grade spans, elementary, middle, and high school. This is specifically looking at the status level cut scores. And so the rows that um, are in black, those are the actual cut scores. And again, this is the minimum number that if you earn that score, you would be in that um, in the higher of the two categories that are listed there. So for example, if we look at that um, leftmost kind of uh, bluish, greenish, uh, I'm not sure the name, sage sort of colored column there um, for reading and mathematics, that cut score of 32 would be the minimum score to have a status um, level of low. We are also required to provide the percentiles based on 2023 data. So the italicized number in parentheses directly below the cut score indicates to you the number of schools, um, of, of schools in each grade span that have scores at or below the given cut. And I just want to say that again, at or below. So it's not the same as the kind of impact data you're probably interested in. We have that a little later. But I just want to be clear um, why we might, if you had any questions about how come that percentile here looks different than when I look at those graphs that show me the impact data. It's because, um, for example, again, if we're looking at that 32, the 3.2, um, is the number of schools, excuse me, the percentage of schools that have a score of 32 or below. Um, 
So when we look at these cut scores again, we're just reading across, you can see what the recommendations are for each of the grade spans. If we go to the next slide, please, and one more further, sorry. So that's just a summary of what those cut scores are. Um, and the following slides, this is where we show um, by grade span the impact data that I'm guessing is of more interest to you, <laughs> um, particularly in those graphs. So again, just to walk through one very briefly for reading and mathematics at the elementary level, again, we're situated around status, which is current year outcomes. Um, when we look at that cut score of 32, 3.1% of schools have a score below 32. So that's the um, percentage of schools that have a rating of very low. Um, similarly, if we look at the very high, we have 12.4% of schools that have a score of um, 81 or above. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we how we're reading that impact data. This is the percentage of schools that have ratings and uh, excuse me levels, um, each of those status levels. Um, if we scroll through here, if you don't mind, Meredith, um, you can see um, similarly the, the distributions of the outcome data, um, the impact data for the remaining status um, cut scores at the elementary level. And if we kind of keep going, <clears throat> these are the middle school cuts and those uh, impact data on the following slides. You can go again and then we'll see high school where of course we have two more indicators so we get a third impact slide here <clears throat> thank you one more and then um, we transition to change and um, i just wanted to linger here because this uh, is an opportunity to underline uh something that Associate Commissioner Sims pointed out, which is that difference in scale that we see um, when we're um, the kind of range of scores that we see for status compared to change. So when we look at the cut scores here, we do have change scores that are negative. You can see that evidenced by the recommended cuts. Um, and we've shown again the percentiles of schools at or below that threshold. And if we'll just proceed again, we'll see the remaining cuts and then I just want to um, the impact data for the change cut scores as recommended. And here's elementary and we'll proceed to middle. And then we'll go on up to high school. And we're going to pause on this slide for just a moment. I just want to point out that um, this was the one area where we did have um, a recommendation by the group um, and there was um, agreement. We had at least two thirds of the group agree to adjust the cut scores um, for declined significantly and declined and declined and maintained um, to, to those negative five and negative two. They were interested in having consistency across those two indicators. Um, and so those two cut scores were um, were adjusted by the group as a collective and they voted and approved to make those changes. And now we're looking at overall performance. So again, as um, we pointed out earlier, uh, we have status and um, change scores. And again, Associate Commissioner Sims talked about how those are combined. We're adding them together. Um, those are then, those indicator scores are weighted and uh, the weighted scores are added together and that produces an overall score. So the group had an opportunity to think about performance across indicators as well as um, where those overall scores sort of fall in the distribution of performance. You can see here the recommended um, cut scores for overall um, performance ratings and again those percentiles and the impact data follow on the remaining slides. So that's all we wanted to just make sure we had a chance to kind of briefly touch on each of the sort of system components with you today. Uh, we appreciate your time and attention and happy to take any questions that you have um, or any other discussion that that you'd like to um, facilitate. Dr. Fletcher. At this time, are there any um, member of LSAC online or in person like to ask any questions?
of Superintendent Borchers. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. A um, couple questions. I, I appreciate Jennifer tried to help me understand this the other day when I talked to her on the phone. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, with the indicator score, that's basically the score that drives your overall rating. Is that correct? Correct. It's the okay. indicator score, the number, the indicator score uh, that is multiplied by the weight. So remember, mm -hmm. reading and math is heavily weighted because of federal requirements. The board accepted those weights, and then those weights are all combined together, and that gives you a single overall number. And it's that number that is put in rank order for the drawing of the 5% line. For federal purposes. Remember, no new CSI schools this year. That's an every three year identification. But we draw the line annually because people may exit from CSI status by coming above the line. Uh, and also, we have to have it for the TSI work of how groups are performing. But that's okay. correct. And, and this is something that we're going to set that's going to be over the next five or six years, right, Rhonda? Is that the way the, I read that? The goal is that this would be year one of the cuts and they would stay in place for six years and that is barring no change and what i shouldn't say change <laughs> let's say that's bearing no revision in legislation obviously okay, well, you've we've pretty frequent almost, go you've ahead dealt with you for almost 20 years so you know i got a few questions ron to say <laughs> well here's, and again, here's what i'm you here's set them and leave them alone that's the goal yeah here, Here's what I struggle with because I'm looking. This year's the first year of the data, but and I gave this example to to uh, Jennifer. But if I had, let's just use reading and math since you mentioned it. Let's say I had a school that scored really well last year at 80, but this year they dropped back and scored a 70, so they lost their change is negative 10, right? So their overall indicator score is going to be a 60. Had another score that struggled the first year that got a 50. They improved to 60, so their change is 10, so their indicator scores a 70. So they're 10 points above this first school, school and never came close to scoring academically the way they scored. Is that, that's kind of what I'm struggling with. I, I understand how the change has to be embedded. I look at another example because I go back to my map testing. You know, like if you're, if you're in the lower level, you got to grow a lot more than you do in the higher level. So if you have a graduation, a school with graduation rate of a 94 and improved to 91, they're going to be at 96. Somebody that had an 88 and got a 93, now all of a sudden they're at a 98. And they're grad, is there anything in this that kind of accounts for that? Or is there a safe harbor? Because I'm worried as we go down this year, because we only have two sets of data, it makes sense. But I'm worried as we go further down this, it seems like this could penalize the schools that have done well more or you get more benefit from being lower and growing than you get being stay in your status when you're higher and you could drop back quicker. Is, is, is there any kind of correlation study done with that? Laura's laughing at me, I can see. I'm not laughing. I'm saying I'm thinking, were you in the room with us at the standard setting? Because <laughs> these uh, very similar uh, questions arose uh, from the participants in that in that group, which is just reflective of um, the thoughtfulness of those participating and, and of your questions today. And I would I would add, and I'll, I'll turn to others here at the table with my team and and obviously our center staff. I do think there was a lot of thoughtful discussion among the panelists trying to think forward that you know we're setting it today but it ideally lives in legislation for six for six years uh and again unless there's some revision to the system and i do think people were very thoughtful about that uh and i think they tried to build in some sort of little bit of safe heart around some of the levels of maintenance in case you had some sliding back a little bit because you know again the cuts that define the maintain versus the the high and very high i think they were trying to sort of build that in a little bit but you know i think it's just the nature of this focus on change because change is about comparing where you were in the last year to the current year and so some of it i think uh, superintendent borgers is really just the structure of what 
the definition of status and change is. But I'll turn to Jennifer, do you have anything you want to add? And then we'll see if our center folks and, sure. or Kevin have anything. I think one of the the, the goals mm -hmm. of the legislation was that um, to encourage um, improvement in student performance and to um, celebrate the fact that uh, when schools increase their students outcome and this system does that. And you can see that uh, particularly with the change and the recommended cut scores with that. That five by five table that brings change and status together really highlights the fact that if there is any change, no matter how small and incremental, that is seen as a positive, uh, in a positive light. So as we know as educators, um, students move, they don't move linearly. Uh, it's not a linear progression that, you know, you move up and maybe take a step back, but the, the goal is to continue to, to rise. Um, uh, the system celebrates that increase, no matter uh, in that change, so that um, when you bring that the emphasis of change and that positive mm -hmm. nature that is reflected in the the ratings as well as the scores. Except I'm like on the ahead. chart. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, thanks, Super Jim Borders. One of the things that, um, and I agree, there's a lot of discussion about that within the committee. Mm -hmm. and, um, and many of us have been around long enough to see change. We've talked about growth. Student growth was a factor. Um, and if you look at statute, it says status and change shall receive equal weight in determining overall performance. And I think that was the point of the uh, color uh, chart, that five by five chart that shows you if you increase or decrease, then you get a color rating. Um, the same happened in the star. Uh, if you remember the star accountability ratings, if a s school had a significant growth, um, for example, I, if you look through it, there were several five star schools that if you looked at their um, just we'll call it their status score. Uh, they may not be among, among the top in the state, but the change pushed them over into that five star rating. Uh, I agree with Superintendent Borchers. If you are a green or a blue level school that you've that you're at the top, the challenge is to maintain. And if you decrease, you can you can still afford to decrease decrease a little bit and stay in that same general area. But if you decrease a lot, that's where the color table would bring down a, if you will we'll say, give a school a lower rating because of the change element. Um, more than likely, I think with er everything that we do, when you talk about change or you talk about student growth, um, if you're a lower performing school or you have been a lower performing school and you have a really good year where you increase, then there's uh, the legislation would appear to want to give you credit for that. Uh, but I agree, Superintendent Borchers, if you're a, if you're a blue school, uh, the challenge is to maintain, whereas if you're a low performing school, the challenge is to improve. Uh, but again, I, I think with what uh, KDE was dealt with, with the uh, the requirement statute, I think this was a pretty good um, method, if you will, of combining. So yeah, last question and I'll be quiet, Rob. <laughs> so go ahead. Ron, so the, I guess where I'm getting lost is you get a you get a score in your status, you get a score in your change, but but that that never you never you never get an overall change score for your whole school. Is that correct? That that's correct. That's correct. See, that's that's correct. where I get that's where I get you get those individual change scores for each 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 area, but when I look at fifty fifty. Was there any discussion of having, okay, here's your overall status score, here's your overall change, and those combined? Because I, I, when people look at this, all they're going to look at is that indicator. And you know that as well. When this gets reported, they're going to look at the combined indicator and your overall score. You really got to dig in to understand if Sheila and I both have, we could both end up with the same indicator scores, and we could have that exact scenario Robbie described it. Right. Sheila's school did a great job and improved. My school was high and, and dropped or vice versa, but they end up with the same indicator score. So I think that's going to take a lot of time to try to unwrap with our boards and our staffs, because when you combine those two into that score, that's where I've really struggled with trying to understand this. Because the way I read the statute is you get status score and you get a change score. Well, there's no really overall change score or status score individually for any school. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And I I would point out, I think, uh, and I'll have others obviously weigh in as well. For me, it's the issue of how different these scales are. You know, typically if you put something together and it's usually just sort of a straight average <clears throat> and that just cannot work with is the way the mathematics are. So let me just give you, uh, you know, a classic example. Uh, you know, I think it's most dramatic if you think about something like graduation rate. You know, we would have a federal requirement to have to report a particular way because that's very defined. But if we calculated graduation where we put together status and change and we did it equally, you have a lot of districts that, you know, might be at 97% graduation rate. Maybe they gain one point gain a percentage, you know, they increase to 98. Well, if you really are adding those together and doing sort of an average, you're adding that 97 and one to 98, and then you're dividing by two. And I don't think anybody could communicate, well, in Kentucky, we're using a graduation rate and my number is 40 something. No one I think would intuitively understand that given our history in Kentucky. I think it works the same way with something like proficiency. You know, rather high proficiency score is 80. Maybe I grow by two, but then if I do that simple put it together, where I'm adding it together and creating an average, I'm down in the 40s. So I think the the scales are so different. And you saw that example on the cuts. You know, I think we saw on the elementary one, the low was maybe around a negative seven up to maybe a positive four, but you're putting that together with a scale that's ranging up to 125 or 140. So I think mathematically, it just uh, it just doesn't communicate what's happening at the school level. And it was a real, it has been the challenge piece of the system of how to bring this together. And we've looked at lots of technical options. And one of them I'll remind you of, uh, we have come, you can take two very different scales and you can transform them both and create a third scale. But then you've got to communicate what's the third scale mean. And I will just say one word for those of you who've been around a while, concordance. You may remember when we had a concordance process where you had to look up a score and then you had to look up if what it would be in the new score. That was incredibly confusing. And uh, so I think that's the challenge, Superintendent Borgers. It's it's not it's simple in its concept, but it's not simple in the math. And uh, it would not convey, I think, what you want to convey about the performance in your district. And so we went through lots of different options and we settled on something that was really simplistic. But the system really doesn't call, uh, you know, and we also went to the board early on in the process because a few other states use change, and most of them use a five by five table to put change together at the individual level. And so the board kind of signed on to that reasonable way. And I've heard Jennifer describe this very eloquently. You're right, unpacking it at your district level with why you're a color and why your number is, is going to be important for your work. Uh, I think what's there, seven ways you can be yellow yes. on the table? And so you do have to think about how did I get to that sale of yellow? And so it does have a, a greater complexity behind the scenes, even though the surface of what's reported is very simplistic. But all good questions. Uh, super and I would add just, if I could add just one thing. Yeah, please. It, um, just thinking about the, um, appreciate all those points. And I just want to kind of situate you back to thinking about what the reports look like, that dashboard that KDE has um, carefully designed um, because this again superintendent board chairs this very topic also came up in the committee conversations about wait there's sort of different pathways to the same indicator score and how do we under help people understand the differences and the group sort of landed back to say well the difference comes down to what their status and change levels are um, because that helps us situate what the starting point was and a lot of people thought of the starting point as the status outcome and um, so just as a reminder, the dashboard does show, uh, and I appreciate your point, uh, human nature. People look at the indicator uh, ratings and the overall ratings, that's what they're gonna be interested in, but happily and conveniently, those indicator ratings directly beneath it shows the status level and the change level. So it's all displayed together when you're looking at those indicator outcomes. So you can see, um, 
schools that have um, similar indicator ratings, but you can see the difference immediately there between their status and change levels. And I think those distinctions can help inform the conversation you might have about what distinguishes performance and, and what the underlying scores are in those systems. So I, I hope that that would be helpful. And I'll add on one other item here. I, I think what Katie tried to do, and I think they did a pretty good job with, with the parameters. There's the parameters from state requirements, and then there's also federal uh, parameters also. And as basically as I as what I try to understand as the colors are required in statute, uh, it talks about you have to have a color coded performance level for each state indicator that's in statute. You have to have five uh, status level ranging from very high to very low and five change levels ranging from increase significantly to decline significantly. So the colors are required in Kentucky statute, but you also have to have a method of ranking schools. Uh, by federal to get that bottom 5%. So the numbers are required uh, just in order to be able to rank schools, you have to have the numbers. Um, I will say this, um, and to add to the point about, uh, uh, in this case, change, I wanna go back to growth. Um, four or five years ago when we had the growth settings, each student got a rating of uh, a proficient, apprentice, novice, distinguished, based on their individual growth. So once you uh, translate that growth into a novice apprentice performance type rating, you could get a number and then marry those two numbers together for an overall score. Um, again, for us today, we're here to vote on cut scores. And if if you were to ask Dr. Fletcher, and for what it's worth, if I were to design a, an accountability system, one, I like what we're doing with status. I would prefer to go back to some level of student growth. Again, that's not in statute, but in my personal opinion, where did you get the student and where did you take them? That's the best level of accountability. Where did you get the student and where did you take them? And also too, some measure of local performance. Again, that's not part of this, but with what we have in statute, I think that um, we, I think KD did the best they could uh, with the requirements of color and also the federal requirements of number. Uh, again, for us, I wish we could uh, put together a group and look at a whole new accountability system as we move forward. But for us today, it's about cut scores. And, and again, Superintendent Borchers, I agree with everything that you said. I think that you make excellent points uh, about uh, issues within, within this accountability system. And that's something that was discussed at length. Uh, probably some of our longest discussions was, well, what happens when you have a school that is blue that may drop and then they have the same color rating as a school that may not have near the same status. But again, going back to what's required, status and change are supposed to have equal weighting. And that's that's I think they did a good job with that. Any other comments or questions from the group? Again, I'd like to thank Superintendent Borchers for uh, for his questions, and I think they were excellent. Uh, any others? Uh, just just a just a really quick. I'm looking around. Uh, that, 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 that's okay. okay. Um, from someone who who's who's been you, you know immersed in this since the beginning, mm -hmm. it it's you know I still don't know, I don't know it to the to the depths that you guys do, uh, but but you know I, I have a. a basis of understanding my, my concern is and this is as I as I talk to our instructional folks in our district is um, um, the, how do we communicate this to to our, our community and to our families in a way that that they understand it um, again because I've, I've kind of been brought along um, and uh, Amanda Reed who also served on this committee did an excellent job of, of sitting down and walking me through this and we created our, our own charts and, and we even looked at the data from our own schools to kind of determine, you know, the same things that, that, that uh, uh, Superintendent Borchers is talking about where, you know, one of our schools is going to experience something like that. So that that's just that's just as I think about how, how we roll this out, if we if we've got some kind of. Um, you, you know, community friendly language or design that that would help superintendents. Um, you know, communicate this to to their their community sure. families. Thank you. Sure. 
Thank you. We appreciate that, Superintendent Riley. We do have some resources and we'll be rolling those out as we get closer to the release. We already have some resources out. One thing that I think particularly will help Superintendent Borger is just thinking of unpacking things. We've done a calculator for years. It's kind of a what if sort of calculator. If I change this kid, this level, what does it do to the overall? We will have that calculator and we'll be ready to share that with people when you get your quality control day where you'll see everything uh, for your district. We anticipate that uh, is coming up maybe within the next week and uh, Jennifer you I know we're working on resources as well on the communication piece and the school report card is a, a really good tool to communicate and I think that was part of the legislation as well that it um, the ratings are um, displayed on a dial so it's high level color coded um, those colors are our indicators for our families and communities. So those, that's a really simple and easy way to look at things as, on a dial. For us, though, when we get down into the level of the details that that we want to be in, that's where where it gets really complicated. And, and I guess what we're because we will obviously if we have a a school that was green last year, and then they're going to be you know yellow orange this year. We've got to somehow be able to explain that. Uh, to, to those those families so that it doesn't reflect negatively on the work that, that our, our teachers and principals are doing. Any other questions or comments? Um, one other comment I will make, we were privileged to, we weren't privileged to individual school data, uh, but we looked at some overall data and if you compare the status from the previous year to status this year, there was a, a larger percentage of schools that either stayed the same or increased when compared to schools that decreased. So, uh, you know, if you're just comparing status to status, and that's not something that's going to be done, but if you just compared status to status, it was a uh, it was a good year for our our students as far as growth, especially out coming out of COVID. So, very very pleased with that. Any others? All right, we will be voting on the. Uh, this does require a motion and a roll call vote. And uh, do I have a motion to approve the accountability standard setting committee's recommended cut scores for status, change, and overall performance at all grade levels, elementary, middle, and high? Harry Burchett, Harrison County, I'll make that motion. Thanks, Superintendent Burchett. Do we have a second? I'd like to second that. Second okay. by Superintendent Riley. Any further discussion? Not. Uh, Dr. Brewer would roll call vote, please. Kirk Biggerstaff. Kirk Biggerstaff, yes. Mike Borchers. Mike Borchers, based on the requirements, yes. <laughs> Harry Burchett. <laughs> Harry Burchett, yes. Tom Cochran. Tom Cochran, yes. David Cox. David Cox, yes. Robbie Fletcher. Robbie Fletcher, yes. Will Hodges. Will Hodges, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Karen Solis. Karen Solis, yes. Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Hey, Chair, all members have voted. Hey, thank you very much. And again, thank you, Associate Commissioner Sims and the work of, uh, of your group. And again, also to the center. Um, it was a great process. It was a time consuming, difficult process, but the people that served on the committee too, I want to take the opportunity to thank those folks because uh, there was a lot of time, a lot of hard work that was put into it. I think we had 26 members of that committee around that yep. neighborhood around that. Uh, for, for three days uh, in uh, September and two days in June. And again, I'd like to thank each of those committee members that took part in that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, our next items deal with reviews uh, for regulations for review and action. But before we do, we have uh, interim commissioner Robin Fields Kenny has stepped in from her earlier meeting. When you get called to the Capitol building, you can't say no, and we fully understand that. But I want to give you an opportunity if you have a few words to say. Thank you very much, Chair Fletcher. Um, welcome to all of you and to those that we have online. Um, Chair Fletcher indicated when you get called to the Capitol, you go. But I guess I should confess. I offered to come. So I did reach out to the Government Contract Review Committee um, because that that's legislators all in the same place at the same time, um, which afforded me an opportunity to just go and introduce myself um, to let them know that I am the Interim Commissioner of Education appointed on September 30th, that um, I'm still okay after the first week on the job. 
and to let them know that um, the staff here at KDE are available to assist them and provide information. Um, whether we are talking about contracts, which is under their immediate purview as member as members of the Government Contract Review Committee, but also as we can as they consider important legislation that affects education and also the upcoming biennial budget request. So a really good opportunity for me to just go over and do a quick meet and greet. Um, we did have other agenda items on a government contract review, and then I slipped out of there before that that started. So it was a pleasure to meet with them. Um, my intentions and my goals in these very first weeks is to try to get myself over in front of as many legislative members as I can um, so that they know my name and my face and that the department is here and available for assistance. Um, it has been a busy first week. Um, but I want to express my appreciation and thanks to many of the members on this committee specifically because I've heard from you and I've heard from other people, other superintendents out in the field, um, just words of support and encouragement. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of our superintendents in my former role as Associate Commissioner of Finance and Operations. So whether we've been talking about seek funding or buses or facilities or breakfast or um, even the, the work around the unfortunate floods and tornadoes, I've really had an opportunity to listen and learn from our superintendents, which I've greatly appreciated and I think will be of lots of value to me in this position. So I look forward to continuing to work with each of you and please don't hesitate to call if I can help. I've talked to several of you on the telephone already and um, I look forward to working with you. I also want to share with you that um, part of the reason that I was comfortable in accepting the interim position is the quality of the staff here at KDE. And you've had the opportunity to hear from Rhonda and her team this morning. Um, they've done a wonderful job in a very difficult task. Um, I agree that the process, what I've learned about the process was a really good one. Um, it is trying to be collaborative and inclusive and listen to other voices as well as the experts in the room we have here at KDE. So we'll continue to do that. And the rest of the leadership team here at KDE is exceptional as well. Um, they strive for that same degree of excellence as well as all of our staff here at KDE. So um, you have our continued commitment to uh, delivering that excellent customer service to you. And um, I look forward to continuing to work with each of you in this new role. So thanks so much for letting me kind of slip into the agenda at a at a different spot. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions about how the first week has gone. <laughs> well, it's a tell sign that you're still smiling. Yes. And that's that's a wonderful thing. So after a weekend, you're still smiling. Uh, I'll make a comment. I'd like to thank Kentucky Department of um, Kentucky Board of Education. I think they made an excellent choice. Um, I've always had great results when I talked to anyone in, in your uh, division and group and that they've always been so helpful and uh, as a matter of fact we'll hear from a couple gentlemen here in just a second but does anyone have any questions for our interim commissioner so at this point congratulations not condolences uh, so congratulations on the new role and and I really look forward to all the work that you're doing thank, thank you, you so very much. much so this time we do have two regulations for our view and act upon act on up uh, first we have uh Mr. Che Ritter and Matt Ross from the Office of Finance and Operations, and they'll be discussing uh, C702KR3330, Liability Insurance Regulation. Gentlemen. Thank you. I think Robin came back. She gets nervous from up here alone. She thinks I'm going to change the funding model. <laughs> at least attempt to. Uh, she has worked with you the longest. That, that, yeah, she knows. She knows. She knows. <laughs> It's dangerous to have me up here. Uh, this is uh, going to seem a little bit like deja vu. If you remember, I think it was July 25th when LSAC met. Uh, there was an insurance regulation put in front of LSAC. Um, some questions popped up. We went back to the drawing board and corrections have been made. I believe it was Superintendent Burchett uh, to give him full credit for reading the regulation. We appreciate that. Uh, so this is kind of a, a fix. Plus, going forward, we've also sent out a survey. I checked this morning. I think we have 85 responses from districts. Uh, we've talked to KEA as well. But I do want to emphasize that survey is still open. So if your district hasn't uh, chimed in on that, it's a very short survey. Probably won't take five minutes. It was sent September 12th. 
uh, from Steve Lyle. So if you, and it went to your finance officers, I should clarify that. Uh, so if they can respond to that, please uh, have them do so. I'm not sure when we're going to close it, but pretty soon, I think. Um, just real quickly, uh, Senate Bill 3 during the 2023 regular session um, requires the Kentucky Board of Education to promulgate an administrative regulation. As you know, regulations take a long time uh, to get through the, the system, if you will. So we had to start pretty early on this. And the regulation in and of itself uh, provides that KDE provide excess liability insurance. And one reason we're sending out the surveys to kind of understand the market, if you will, of what districts are covering and what KEA's uh, standard is for teachers as well. Uh, we're trying to develop a cost. So in a strange way, we're kind of putting the, I think the cart before the horse because of the regulation has to be in place. And we're still gathering information about what this would cost uh, the state budget basically for our excess coverage. Um, I believe, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong. That Well, I, I will say that, so the, the bill required us to promulgate a regulation for uh, school districts to purchase the primary liability insurance, the statute uh, once the bill once codified, the statute requires the department to secure the liability, the excess liability insurance. So that's not included in the regulation because it's in the statute. And you, and uh, just as you, as drafting regulations, you don't include things that are already in the statute. Generally, that's frowned upon. So that is a statutory requirement. The statute says KDE promulgates a regulation requiring districts to purchase their primary. So that's why we're bringing this regulation forward. So, um, yeah, that's generally it. We'll be glad to answer any questions that we can, if there are any questions. I think uh, if you look at the KRS 160.105, what uh, the gentleman had been uh, talking about, the Kentucky Board of Education shall by regulation require each school district two and in section two, provide each certified employee of the district with primary liability insurance coverage for an amount of not less than $1 million for the protection of the employee from liability arising in the course and scope for pursuing the duties of employment. Uh, I think the question came in our last meeting on the excess, if it goes over that liability. And, and again, I want to thank uh, your department, your group for taking this back and working on this. I think this looks so much cleaner. Uh, and so again, I want to appreciate that too. And if you'll notice, the regulation also goes through and really establishes a process, if you will, through the Educators Employment Liability Insurance Program uh, to get the information from districts also too. So um, yeah, I'd like that, to thank you to Superintendent Burchett for really catching that. And uh, and uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, in my haste to get the regulation here, I overlooked that. And I think a careful reading, you caught it and we really appreciate that. I had uh, also had Superintendent Cochran to give me a call and, also, and Superintendent Burchett both to give me a call yeah. on that regulation right before we came in and uh, it was a great point. So again, thank you for taking it back. Thank you to our gentleman for, for uh, catching that. Uh, are there any questions from our members or uh, including those online? Okay, hearing none, do I have a motion? Excuse me. Um, do I have a motion to approve 702 KR3330 liability insurance regulation? I'll make a motion. And by Superintendent Raleigh, do I have a second? Second. Second by Superintendent Tilford. Any discussion? At this time, Dr. Brewer, roll call vote, please. Kirk Biggerstaff. Kirk Biggerstaff, yes. Mike Borchers. Mike Borchers, yes. Harry Burchett. Harry Burchett, yes. Tom Cochran. Tom Cochran, yes. David Cox. David Cox, yes. Robbie Fletcher. Robbie Fletcher, yes. Will Hodges. Will Hodges, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Aaron Solis. Aaron Solis, yes. Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate your time. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you members. Next, we welcome Beth Hargis and Reagan Satterwhite from the Office of Career and Technical Education. We're talking about amendments to uh, 70, Title 705 KR Chapter 4 uh, 231. Good morning. We're requesting continuation and amendment again to 705 uh, KAR 4231 which is the program standards for um, secondary career and technical education programs. 
Perkins 5 is the primary federal law established to develop and support career and technical education programs at both the secondary and post-secondary levels. The proposed amendments align the language of our general program standards, standards for CTE to Perkins 5 and helps ensure Kentucky's um, continued eligibility of these funds. The amendments include updated program areas and removes outdated language. We have struck references to the word vocational as it generally refers to the trade program areas. And today CTE is so much broader and inclusive and really encompasses many areas, including but not limited to STEM, um, healthcare, and, and the manufacturing. The amendments also include references to industry recognized certificates and credentials, uh, which are approved by the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board. And that is per, again, KRS 158-6455 and 703-KAR-5270. And finally, the amendments include the Perkins 5 requirement for schools to comply with offering an estate-approved four-course sequence of courses for a pathway or a state-approved local level modification, along with offering an appropriate career and technical student organization as a co-curricular part of the pathway. And so now, if you have any questions, I'll let Reagan answer those. <laughs> Any questions from our group? I am curious. You said you struck uh, the the language of the vocational and simply re back with CTE mm -hmm. at this point. We are trying to get we're trying to get away from vocational right. and call right. it career and technical organization. Just or, simply, I'm sorry, career and technical education. Right. Mm -hmm. Any others? I read the fiscal note correctly, there are no additional costs or revenues or savings for districts or for KD, correct? Right, correct. That's accurate. Is there anything that's in this that goes over and above the statute? No, and, and there's nothing in this new amendment that we are proposing that will change the way that schools and districts are currently operating. We've been operating by Perkins 5 since it was enacted in 2019. Thank you. Other questions? Hey, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve proposed amendments to Title 705, Chapter 4, Regulation 231, the General Program Standards for Secondary Career and Technical Education Program? I'll make that motion, Mike Borchers. I have a motion by Superintendent Borchers. Do we have a second? I'll second that, Tom Cochran. Second by Superintendent Cochran. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Dr. Brewer, please. Kirk Biggerstaff. Kirk Biggerstaff, yes. Mike Borchers. Mike Borchers, yes. Harry, Harry Burchett. Harry Burchett, yes. Tom Cochran. Tom Cochran, yes. David Cox. David Cox, yes. Robbie Fletcher. Robbie Fletcher, yes. Will Hodges. Will Hodges, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Karen Solis. Karen Solis, yes. Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Next, we've talked a little bit about this. We have, uh, we do have uh, our Kentucky Board of Education mentor, Ms. Patrice McCrary, to give to gather feedback from LSAC members to help inform the search for the next Commissioner of Education. And um, Board Member McCrary may be having some uh, PTSD from all the discussion as she served on the Accountability Committee meeting. Uh, those are some intense days, but they were good days. Uh, so again, if all that discussion before may uh, may get you started for this, but we appreciate you being here for uh, the input. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I will admit, I believe my blood pressure went up <laughs> during the course of the conversation. It was an intense and uh, interesting few days that we went through, but you uh, should be very, very pleased with your rep representation on that committee. Superintendent Sheila Miller was there, and of course, your own Chair Fletcher was there, and their input was valuable. Um, now, earlier today, um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Thomas Woods Tucker 
gave you a little teaser when he said that the board has been going around to all of the advisory committees, gathering input on what your desires, your hopes, your wishes, your dreams for this new commissioner that will be coming into to our Commonwealth will be. Um, surprise, guess what? It's your turn. And you're going to get to have that uh, opportunity to speak out today. Um, I, I will say, I've been in this room a gazillion times, it feels like, and this is the first time I've been on this side of this table, and you all look impressive. <laughs> you really look good. Um, and before I jump off with this, thank you. Thank you for what you do in your districts. Um, you are phenomenal. You um, make us proud every day. So if Nobody has said thank you to you today or that you are appreciated. Consider it done right now. Thank you and you are appreciated. All right, let's jump right into this. Now, Chair Robinson has asked that we come in and we do this with our advisory groups. And um, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to give you. I want your very honest feedback. Dr. Meredith Brewer over in the corner, our wonderful, amazing uh, Dr. Brewer is going to capture this conversation and we're going to gather all of the information from all of the advisory committees and we're going to share that data with the search firm. We're going to ask them to look very carefully at it because these are the wishes of the Commonwealth. Um, so we want you to have part in that. Okay, are you ready? Question number one, what are some qualities you'd like in Kentucky's next commissioner? Okay, let's open the floor. Um, any of our LSAC members would like to answer that question, please? Whoop. Are we talking person, personal qualities or professional qualities or just in general? I would say the whole scope. Okay. And and I will tell you, I'm, I'm a teacher of 31 and a half years, and I have excellent wait time capacity. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all agree that we want someone who is kid-focused, student-focused, first and foremost. If we focus on our students as our priority every day and – Put the adults and politics and policies secondary, uh, further on back perhaps, will be just fine. But I think a leader that is focused on the, the students of the Commonwealth. Can't agree with you more. Excellent. And, and I, I, this may go along with that, but but I really appreciate um, the the where where we're moving or where we were moving when 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 Dr. Glass left. And I'm talking about in terms of of the deeper learning. Uh, our district is part of uh, a part of L3, the learner profile work. And the reason I say that is, be, is because those are the kinds of things that, that the folks in my community and uh, our families were, were, were asking for. They're, they're wanting to see that project based learning, that hands on type stuff that, that kids there. There's you know, the, the whole child approach. Um, so the kids are more than just, you know, that one single test score. That's something that I was going to um, say is just to have someone that has that broad vision, that broad perspective of education and, it, you know, not just the academics, but, you know, um, as a new superintendent, just being able to find someone that has the uh, the vision for all students, you know, that it's not just those that are college bound, but those that are CTE and career oriented. And, you know, we need those uh, individuals trained as well. So exactly. Yes. Others? This is Superintendent Mitchell from Anderson County, and I like to say um, just a couple of things. One, um, a great communicator among stakeholders, um, including superintendents. Um, I couldn't agree more about the importance of keeping our students um, the center of all decision making and um, all that we um, all that we do 
um, but also someone that has experience and understands um, Kentucky and um, that is willing to work very closely with superintendents um, as well as just um, faculty and staff um, of Kentucky. Excellent. Any others? I think that um, uh, one of the things that we talk about as superintendents is visibility. Um, we, would, I think, from personally, I'd like to have someone that's not only visible in Frankfort, which, uh, but also visible in Western Kentucky, also visible in Eastern Kentucky, and and visiting and and shaking hands with our students and uh, and uh, and communicating with all groups, with all uh, not only just our students, um, especially our students, but also our stakeholders. Um, but again, being visible from Paducah to Pockville, if you will. So I think that would be very important. Also, we're very diverse. Yes. Stay. So seeing every point of view, yes, is important. So yes, yes. These are all excellent points. I know you've got some more and this is your chance. This is it. This is your chance. Well, Dr. Keeney or not Dr. Me, me either. I get called Dr. So I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on the television. <laughs> Uh, but you alluded to this earlier, which I think is important, you, you know, getting out and and getting in front of as many legislators as, as possible and, um, I, I, you know, putting um, politics aside and, and, and focusing what's what's best for kids. Uh, and I know that gets difficult sometimes. Things get so polarized and politicized, but just being able to, to keep those things separated and keep the focus on what Russ said and, and that uh, – keeping kids first, but I do think developing those relationships with legislators. Pretty critical. They're the ones, they're the decision makers. What we do, what we have placed in front of us, so yes. Uh, thinking of your peers, they come to you, they respect you, you're on this advisory committee. Um, what are some of the things you're hearing? You're you're there. You're speaking for them right now too. What are you hearing? This is Dave Cox and Corbin. I'm I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. I've had some technical issues this morning, but uh, hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, I, I think. And by the way, Mike Borchers, I agree with everything you said as well. I was trying to get in there, and and my technology person had abandoned me here. So at any rate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your comments, but, but I, I, my whole focus is kind of on approachability. I just think that that this is a a, a time right now uh, that that we need we need to have have our commissioner's ear, even though it's it's a tough job. You know, he's dealing with 172, three districts, whatever there is, and you know we're, we're dealing with uh, with thousands of constituents who who are expecting things from us. And 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 I don't mean this to to be throwing anybody on the bus at all. So please don't take it that way. But I'm I just tend to be too plain spoken at times, but just it to return a phone call is, is a big deal. And 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 it's 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 a big deal if you've if you've got an issue in your district that that really only this person can can address and you've got to go through a multitude of of uh, roadblocks and obstacles to get to. I I've, I've always appreciated that when, when when that happened. And and I think the people that I talk to, my superintendent buddies, they they they, they would just like to have the super the uh, commissioner's ear and 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 feel like this person is going to be really approachable and, I, and that's the that's the only note that I had and I appreciate uh, appreciate getting to share that with you. Thank you, thank you. This is Mike Borchers. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to just stress I, the thing I hear a lot is is someone who understands Kentucky who understands the diversity of our state, understands how to deal with, like David was saying, our superintendents. And um, also I think what David Riley said too, is someone that's gonna work with, the, be able to go talk at everyone in Frankfurt, like Robin talked about, and, and just be invisible, but understanding all the, when they talk about SEEK and understanding how the SEEK formula works, those, those things are huge, huge things that puts people above anyone else I feel because they're not having a learning curve. They're able to do the things David's talking about because they're not learning all the things about our states. I think there has to be a huge value in someone at least understands some of the main things of our state and how they work. 
Excellent. Yes. I'd say we've talked a lot about uh, the diversity of Kentucky. That's evident in our geography. We, we, those of us, of us that remember our Kentucky geography classes from years ago, uh, and the bluegrass. I thought that. I did too. <laughs> uh, and the bluegrass and the knobs and the western Kentucky coal fields and the eastern Kentucky coal fields. And um, um, I think that that's a huge factor in this, recognizing that on a statewide level, because it every one of our communities are so vastly different and and the representation on this board is so vastly different um and you know also the idea that the history of kentucky with regards to the kentucky education reform act and the equity and adequacy requirements of that act and how that has to be communicated and led moving forward with the the political environment we're in right now and with our with our uh, communities you know um, the citizens of kentucky we need an, another reminder of that we're charged with educating every child that comes to us and taking them where they are we, we're talking about an accountability system that probably none of us are you know it, it may not be the system we would develop um because uh, we we look at a child and we should be taking a child how they come to us and taking them as far as we can take them and we do that in a year's time right and then next year we, we're, we're going to go at it again um, so I think someone that understands all those aspects and to understand all those aspects I I, I don't want to say that we should be close-minded to anybody outside of Kentucky certainly don't want to represent that but I think you just about need to have some experience or some very very good knowledge and understanding of our history in Kentucky. And it's a rich educational history. Yes. We are known for our educational mm -hmm. history. We so, are. We set the bar yeah. when, when the when the Rose uh, case came forward and the and the Kentucky Education Reform Act came about, we set the bar and the standard for the nation. And we should be proud of that. And we should be looking for a vision that sets a new bar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for Kentucky. Moving with the times. Yes. Excellent. Yes. That was something I was going to um, say just to piggyback on that is just having that willingness to learn and look at, you know, to understand SEEK and to understand and, and look at how it affects each different district or each district differently because we're so, because we are so diverse and not the same. And um, all of those formulas, though they be the same, do not have the same outcome for all different districts, I think that's very important for someone to be willing to learn about and have that history of, of where, we, where we've been and where we're going. Open to those conversations mm -hmm. and openness to an understanding. So look through that lens of how it affects the different, because as you said, you know, across the state, there's such even neighboring districts can be quite different from one another. And to be able to stop and look through the lens of the decisions that I'm making, how does that affect each district differently? I've heard uh, I've heard this today. This is Will Hodges in Greene County, and I hear it repeatedly uh, from some of my colleagues. And I think the term is just Kentucky experience, and I think that 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 will be valuable. Um, another thing I've heard today is kids first, and and I know when things get crazy here in Greene County. Um, you know, a lot of the times I'll, I'll go to a classroom and remember, you know, why I'm in this position and, and what I'm about. And I have a deep passion for teaching and learning. And I think uh, the new person, if they can have that kids first approach and just focus on that teaching and learning and and leave a lot of the other things behind, which have been mentioned today, uh, that, that would be valuable. And um, also, I think Superintendent Riley hit on this just kind of look at where we are. We have a lot of positive and a lot of good things that are happening. So if that new person can be patient and listen and be approachable and look at those positives and continue to build on those positives, I think that will be a plus for Kentucky. Thank you. I don't want to close this off before you're ready on this question, but that is a perfect segue for the next question. Um, I'll give you another opportunity if there's anything that is just burning 
you have a burning desire to share, please do share that before I move to this next question. Okay. This is great. Just, just a little recap, and I want to make sure I've captured this, and Mayor, uh, Dr. Brewer is definitely ca capturing all of this. Um, from the simplest of returning a phone call and building those relationships with, from the commissioner down to the students or up to the students, we should think that way uh, instead. Someone who's very kid friendly, someone who loves kids, someone who cares about kids, someone who understands Kentucky. They understand where we are now. They are a visionary. They have good communication skills. They are visual with our legislators, with our parents, with you all, with our educators, all of our educators, and with our, our students and our communities. Someone who is highly knowledgeable and looking through the, the lens of impact on the diversity of our communities, of our districts, of the issues at hand that you are seeing in and out every day and a deep understanding of our history, our rich history of the Commonwealth and the educational trek that we've been on. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me a thumbs up? Do you feel like I've pretty much captured? Okay, yeah, great, yeah. great. Okay, here comes question number two. You know that a transition can be challenging for us. We are so blessed to have our 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 acting commissioner right now in place who is so well equipped with what is going on in the district so highly respected by community the the Kentucky Department of Education you all obviously I've heard from so many of you and she hit the ground running and we knew she would because we knew what kind of performance she's done throughout the district bringing in a commissioner that first year can be a make or break year, mm -hmm. the critical year. So the question is, what should the new commissioner focus on in their first year? That's a tough question. Um, I'm gonna ask you to put yourself in their place. You've been there as superintendent, the new superintendent, you, you, you know how adjusting into that position is so um what do you anticipate in that first year i'll jump in uh, if, if if we're talking about the first year we've touched on a little bit before but uh you know what do we have I, i'm like david cox i forget we can school uh, districts consolidated we down to 170 171 i'm not, I'm not sure but anyway um, and I know that Dr. Glass did a little bit of this in, in, in the beginning of the, the listing and learning, but um, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is for voices to to be heard. And as we talked about here, it, it's, a, you know, from from Paducah to Pikeville, very, very diverse. And to be able to to listen to all those folks and um, and, and do your very best to to meet the the educational needs of of all those families and all those those children so I, w I would say spend a lot of time uh getting to know uh the, the the people of of kentucky because it is very very diverse even within our own own uh, communities and districts it's it's very diverse so we have to take that time uh to add value to the voices of of, of all those constituents patrice it's a um, I, I think being present and engaged, as I have said before, and I would extend that going going to as many districts as possible, uh, like Commissioner Glass did doing the, the community talks, but also I think being committed to each and every advisory council that we have in our state for student advisory council to the superintendent's advisory council to this to the to LSAC. Um, every time any one of those councils meet, being being present, uh, being committed and being engaged. Along that line, of course, I'm in my second term on this committee. And early on with the first couple of commissioners that I had the, the opportunity to serve with, oftentimes there was some informal discussion after the meeting adjourned. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And that was appreciated, oftentimes as valuable as the, the actual meeting agenda, uh, just to have that camaraderie and that conversation uh, off record. Uh, that was valuable, it really was. And we have missed that as of late. So uh, I think that's important to build that relationship with the folks that are in this building, either as a as a guest, as part of a, a committee, a council, or certainly to build relationships and trust within the folks that work within this department. Sure. I think that's a key piece of it. You've got to have your team built uh, and your team has to trust you and you have to trust your team. There's no way to do that unless you're connected. So I think being here and being together is also valuable for the commissioner in their first year. I think that our interim commissioner has has started this already, but I, I think uh, shaking hands with legislators uh, immediately uh, as quickly as you know uh, i don't know what the timeline is uh, for the hire of the next commissioner but i think it's going to be important to shake hands and and uh, with each of the legislators not only you know we talked about being visible in districts but it's just as important to go through and say you know i want to know who is the budget a and r committee chair i want to know who's the speaker i want i want them to know me by my first name uh, so whoever that new that first commissioner is, they they need to start meeting with legislators early and quickly as possible to build a relationship. Yeah. One of the things I appreciated when I inducted my first year as a superintendent, um, Kevin Brown was uh, in one of his multiple stints as interim commissioner, I guess, uh, and. Uh, of course, he did a great job, and and I know don't have any doubt that that uh, Miss Kenny will do uh, just as well uh, leading us during this interim time. Um, the uh, but he came and brought his um, executive level team uh, to uh, one of those meetings, and uh, we got to have face to face discussions and and introductions uh, of the team leads and their roles, and not only that. Uh, they all shared their part their cell phones contacts with us directly and i can tell you that was as a new superintendent that was hugely important to have that um, outreach and accessibility now that was from a leadership level that he you know asked of his team and um so i think somebody who recognizes that importance um, he's a busy person. He's got 171 districts, or she's got 171 districts to uh, to help support. But they've got a great team as well that can can step up to the plate with that. Um, and we're all not just not just these uh, advisory boards, but you know our our cooperatives. There's a lot of opportunities to be out with uh, those on the ground, uh, having the discussions about all of the important work going on in Kentucky and the important things that we're dealing with, you know, on a daily basis. So just um, I think that distributive leadership model that gets out and about. And I'll tell you a prime example of that. I've watched it for years um, and it and it has carried consistently here is David Couch's team. Um, now, it may be the nature of his of what he does, but he is across the state of Kentucky and has been consistently for the last 25 plus years 30 years um and they're in and out of every district and uh i think that's i think that's really important um so you know as we shift to a new model of 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 how we work you know we there's more remote work going on and stuff especially for some of the people in this office um it should give the opportunity to reallocate some of those resources to making sure we can also at the same time get out in in districts and could I have some clarification? I, I'm sorry I missed at the beginning when you said where the interim commissioner uh, came to a group. What was that group? It, it was the uh, one of the superintendent co- cohorts. So so every you know as you know uh, every year we have a new uh, induction group of new superintendents, and they spend. 18, 20 days, you know, in training, uh, it's a lot. And um, and one of those sessions was uh, at, at a statewide event, and and Kevin Brown came and brought his entire team to that event for that face-to-face induction for those 15 or 20 new superintendents. 
does not surprise me at all. He's mm -hmm. an incredible team builder. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I have one more thing. This is Dave Cox and Corbin. Uh, I want to agree with Superintendent Tilford. I think the time that we used to spend just having general conversation, being able to bring up bring up things from from our district, just anecdotally uh, with the with the commission was, was a great time. I think that would be something that would be awesome to be to be reinstated. But the one thing that 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 concerns me most, and I've been in this 32 years, so I've been I've been around a while. A while just means I'm old. But uh, the the thing that that worries me as much as anything now is just teacher morale and 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 the way our the way our profession and we're all teachers in this room but the way our profession is being perceived by the public and i think there's nobody better than the commissioner to to, to lead this to lead this campaign to to inform folks how great our teachers are we we, we, we and, and I, I think sometimes the public's forgetting that we're in a battle here in south in the very corner of southeastern kentucky we're in a battle with uh with with, with private schools we're in a battle with homeschooling there's 1100 kids in our tri-county area being homeschooled right now we need somebody to be a champion for that and somebody to be a champion for for, for for our teachers because that's the lifeblood of what we do. What we do, what we do is important, but we all started in the classroom. And and, and I hope that this person remembers that and, and, and really focuses on the, the morale of our teachers. Thank you. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I'm counting inside of my head <laughs> on all my evaluation forms. I got excellent marks for for wait time. Um, <laughs> just the kind of big picture, make sure that I've got this in place. The first year, year of listening and learning, spending a great deal of time building relationships because those are critical for success. Being available, I've heard that a lot. Being available, being present, being engaged within the advisory committees and beyond. Um, we do, in Kentucky, we have a great infrastructure in place for our advisory committees, students, superintendents, principals, teachers. So this is an excellent opportunity to build some more of those relationships. Uh, team building, not only the commissioner, but with with you all, but also with KDE, because this is a well-run system. It runs very smoothly here, and um, we want to keep that in place. Um, legislative interaction. We go back to our previous question. That is going to be critical, critical, um, and having that ability to, to interact on both sides of the aisle. Um, I keep hearing communication, 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 and uh, that includes with on-site KDE team, but with you all, with our teachers, with our communities. Um, and then wrapping that all up with a great big bow, you're exactly right. If we do not have teachers in place, our system will crumble faster than anything. You all are important. You are critical to making sure everything goes well. But if there are not teachers on the ground, no matter what you do, we are going to falter. So having that teacher morale in place and uh, supporting our teachers and I loved how you phrased it, being a champion, being a champion for teachers and public education. So that's, wow. Our search team has a big job, <laughs> a big job. But please know your voices have been heard. Your comments will be discussed a lot. They will be shared with the people who are in the process of doing this search. Um, we are doing everything with total fidelity above board. If you think of anything else, you can find my email on KDE site or any board members email. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we love this Commonwealth. <laughs>
your board is built of educators. And we love our kids and we want what's best for them. And we want to meet the needs of all of our students. And we want to be the best support we can possibly be for you all as you undertake the visions that you have, the challenges you have, and the exciting journey that you're leading these students on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, we do appreciate the Kentucky Board of Education reaching out to get input of this committee and other committees throughout the Commonwealth. That's so important. And I think what you're hearing from uh, this committee and also from others that uh, communication is key and you're emulating that. So we thank you for that. Thank you. This time, are any other comments? All minds cleared from our um, our board members? Not. I'm going to ask for a motion for adjournment. Motion by Superintendent Cochran. A second. 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 Representative. I'm sorry, um, Superintendent Tilford. And I want to thank everyone for another productive meeting. We appreciate that. And uh, everyone have a great week. For those of you that may be on fall break, enjoy the rest of the week. Those of you who are not, enjoy it also. <laughs>